When I was 10 years old, I made a bucket list of everything I wanted to do someday before I die. But life is short, and if you wait until someday to check items off your list, it'll never happen. That's why in December, I flew to South America on a whim to watch a shooting star display from the driest place on Earth. I brought my adventure buddy, Alan Chang, the most intrepid person I know. We landed in Santiago, Chile, a city of 6 million people, on December 11th. The air was hot and stale and filled with smog. We spent the next 24 hours plotting our course before flying to Kalama, nearly a thousand miles to the north. Kalama is a copper town home to roughly 150,000 people and is also one of the driest cities in the world. They average only about two tenths of an inch of precipitation every year. When we first landed the night of December 12th, I panicked. Apparently, I had reserved a car with a manual transmission. Fortunately, I was able to procure an automatic and Alan and I drove around the city in search of a late night dinner. The next morning, we ventured east, bound for San Pedro de Atacama. Our lips quickly grew chapped, our eyes stinging. The sun beat down from directly overhead. The region is among the sunniest in the entire world. Welcome to the Atacama Desert, the driest desert in the entire world. Some places here haven't seen rain in more than 400 years, with only an average of a millimeter falling each year in some locales. Ghostly mirages dance in the distance where the sun beat down on the ground, causing imaginary pockets of water to appear and mountains that seem to float. We continued west, passing an eerie abandoned building with the words Loco Eric or Crazy Eric. I was curious, but Alan didn't want to stick around to see who lived there. The Atacama Desert is the world's driest non-polar desert. It spans a strip about 960 miles long in western South America, sandwiched between the cool Pacific Ocean to the west and the Andes to the east. Air warms and it sinks, desiccating about 49,000 square miles of real estate and leaving the ground bone dry. The extreme climate of the Atacama means that only the hardiest and most resilient creatures can survive there. Guanacos and vicuñas, two of South America's four camelid species, graze on sparse pockets of grass that are irrigated by melting snow. Once one gets far enough west in the border with Bolivia, you see something else on the ground, salt. The snow-capped Andes Mountains can also be seen in the distance. Despite the harsh conditions, up to 500 species of plants can be found on the border of the desert. On the rare occasions that even a trace of rainfall occurs, super blooms with vibrant colors are the result. We approached San Pedro de Atacama on the afternoon hours of December 13th. The journey entailed winding roads and steep valleys. I began eyeing spots to watch the meteor shower that night. South America has a lot of earthquakes, all thanks to the active plate tectonics in the area, but at the same time, it sculpts the landscape into castle-like formations, like what you're seeing around here right now. This looks like something you'd see out of a postcard, but this is real life, and it is simply sublime. Though it may not look or feel like it, San Pedro de Atacama is located at a higher elevation than Lake Tahoe, California. The Atacama Desert is a plateau, and some visitors even report altitude sickness. San Pedro de Atacama is known as a very safe town with a lot of tourists in town. There are so many excursions that many folks can do, but the biggest thing, it is in the middle of the desert and offers the best view of the night sky. As soon as we arrived, we stocked up on water, buying close to five liters. Because the air is so dry, you don't sweat. Dehydration can sneak up in a matter of minutes and quickly prove deadly. Then it was time to find dinner, which turned out to be in a building with a mud roof. One of the coolest things here is the building type in San Pedro de Atacama because you have past roofs, you have many buildings made of mud, but you don't have to worry about them getting wet because there's only 1.5 millimeters of precipitation here every single year, i.e. none. Strong desert winds during the heat of the day can loft dust and cause low visibilities. Gusts can approach 40 miles per hour and irritate one's eyes and skin. During the evening hours, we noticed an impressive number of small green plants. Most were bowing down in the wind in tortured positions. Though there's not enough rain to support the out-of-place verdure, moisture in the form of occasional fog can do the trick. You hear the winds behind me right now. We're at about 8,700 feet, what we call the Altiplano, or the High Plains. Behind me, that's Lilan Kabor, a 19,400-foot volcano. As soon as the sun sets in the desert, temperatures plummet 40 degrees or more. It's not uncommon for the mercury to dip well below freezing even in the heart of summer. With no moisture to trap heat or cloud cover to insulate the ground, thermal energy radiates out into space. As temperatures dropped around dusk, the wind died down. That's because pockets of air were no longer rising and tapping into momentum aloft. We call that atmospheric decoupling. The ground was also cooling off faster than the air above it, leading to a narrow layer of dust known as an inversion. It was dangerous to breathe in. Eventually, we settled to sleep with plans of awakening around 1.30 a.m. to watch the meteors. After three hours of sleep, I was up and eager, ready for an adventure. I learned, though, that not everybody likes waking up in the middle of the night. Fortunately, poor Alan quickly came to life when we drove to the Valley of the Moon. 
The Valley of the Moon was declared a nature sanctuary in 1982. Its cavernous nooks and crannies were shaped by thousands of years of wind and water. We decided it would be the perfect place to sit back, relax, and gaze upwards at the heavens. The skies in the Atacama Desert are among the darkest in the world. In U.S. cities, only a dozen stars may be visible every night. In the countryside, perhaps a few hundred. More than 5,000 can be seen ordinarily in the Atacama Desert. The Milky Way appeared overhead like in screensavers and postcards, with other galaxies glowing like luminous tufts of light. Alan and I were simply mesmerized. Then, one by one, meteors began streaking overhead. The Gemini meteor shower occurs every year during the second week of December. That's when Earth plows through a stream of interstellar debris during its annual orbit about the Sun. The debris comes from a comet called 3200 Phython, a space rock about 3.6 miles wide. Small pebbles the size of grains of puffed rice left behind by the comet burn up in Earth's outer atmosphere. They move at about 37 miles per second, which is actually slow for a meteor. Picture bugs spattering and smearing across your windshield. Meteor showers are very similar. The Geminids are rich in sodium, magnesium, and iron. That's why they glow purple, green, and white. Sometimes they even leave luminous trails where compressed air glows. They can be seen in images as streaks of light. The shower also generates lots of fireballs, or meteors brighter than the planet Venus. That makes for extra special viewing. Up to 100 meteors per hour can be seen under clear dark skies. In our case, as soon as the moon set, we were treated to an incredible show. The air was cold, but our spirits were high as shooting stars slipped through the night sky. The air was still and the landscape silent, an isolating peace descending over the vacuous vastness. Sometimes minutes pass in between meteors, tempting us to wonder if the show had fallen dormant. Other intervals featured flurries of sporadic streaking meteors, with three or four occasionally shimmering in a span of 10 seconds. All of the meteors could be traced back to the radiant or the point in the sky from which they appeared to emanate. Many of the meteors were a tease, tracing glimmering veins in the night sky when we blinked or were looking the wrong direction. Others were camera shy, skirting out a flame and only flirting with photography. Watching meteors burn up 60 miles above our head was humbling. Humans are small and life is fleeting. The sky was a serene pageant of peace. The universe was delivering a gift. There were also a few satellites cruising through the night sky as well, including this one, which flared as sunlight glinted off its reflective surface hundreds of miles above the Earth. In the end, we saw dozens of meteors. I counted more than 50. Alan zonked out around 5 a.m. as we drove east back to Kalama. We had an early morning flight to Patagonia in extreme southern South America, which would take us over glaciers, volcanoes, and picturesque portraits of stunning natural beauty. In the end, I was able to cross a lifelong goal off the bucket list, but what made the experience special was having an adventure buddy by my side. Life is filled with memorable moments, but the most meaningful memories are those made and shared with others. Until next time, I'm meteorologist Matthew Capucci for My Radar. Follow My Radar on social media Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Download My Radar on iOS, Android, Amazon Alexa, Xbox, and Windows.